In the early hours of the 5th of November 1605, King James I of England came face to face with a young man who had tried to kill him. That man had been discovered just hours from blowing up the Houses of Parliament and with it King James himself. His name was Guy Fawkes. Had Westminster gone sky high, we'd remember it justly as the worst atrocity in English history. The gunpowder plot is quite staggering in its scale. It would have blown the heart out of English government. I think Guy Fawkes is committed to the gunpowder plot, body and soul. This is the story of a battle between two men, a Protestant king versus a Catholic soldier whose ambition was nothing less than to change the religion of England itself. There was a battle at the time taking place for the very soul of Christianity. This is about faith. This is about a king who's put there by God. So who was Guy Fawkes? And how close did he come to carrying out the greatest terror plot in history? Mind-blowing that not only that people wanted to do it, but they very, very nearly got away with it. In May 1604, a young soldier walked into a pub to sign up to the most dangerous mission of his life. Guy Fawkes is an angry young man. He is tall, he's physically powerful, and he's an experienced old soldier, a man of violence. Guy Fawkes had just returned from years abroad, fighting for the Catholic cause in Europe. Now, he was determined to fight for that same cause in his own country, a country where the majority of the population were fiercely anti-Catholic. He's very willing to kill for his beliefs just as much as he is to die for them. He is clearly deeply angry at the suffering inflicted upon his Roman Catholic community and is out for vengeance. Be an English Catholic at this period is to lead a twilight existence. You are constrained. Your options are closed down. You can't receive an education. Most of the professions are closed to you. It must have been insufferable. And I think Guy Fawkes' actions show just how much it was chafing so many young men at that time. Guy's anger was matched only by the scale of his ambition. He wanted to kill but not just anyone. He wanted to kill the King of England. The previous year, King James, already King of Scotland, had inherited the English throne from his cousin Elizabeth I. For Catholics, who had endured decades of persecution during the reign of Elizabeth, James's accession brought fresh hope. He lacks, to some extent, the aura of kingship. His physical presence isn't necessarily that of an Elizabeth or a Henry VIII. But at the same time, you should never take James lightly. He's a clever, wise and experienced king. He's extremely eloquent, he's highly intelligent, and he's a supremely gifted politician. James had intended to be more tolerant towards Roman Catholics. His own wife is a Catholic convert. The problem is that he is inheriting an English realm where the populace is on the whole now, Protestant by recent conversion, viciously anti-Catholic, and James realizes that if he's going to get anywhere in England, he has to continue the policy of persecution. James could never have given England's Catholics what they wanted. They wanted religious tolerance. They wanted full freedom of worship. What James is offering them is an ability to carry on being Catholic at home, surreptitiously. Many Catholics can buy into that. But a minority simply 
cannot and will not do that. Back in the Duck and Drake pub, Guy Fawkes was about to meet a notorious Catholic rebel. Robert Catesby, who was one of history's truly dangerous men. He was out for something that was as flamboyant, as destructive, as vengeful as possible. He must have been hugely persuasive, hugely charming, um, able to convince birds from trees and fish from water. I think people would have followed him to the death. Guy listened as Catesby revealed a breathtaking plan, one so dangerous that even to discuss it was high treason. His idea was to blow up King James and his government at the next opening of Parliament. As a means of political action, this idea of blowing up Parliament is just absolutely spectacular. The whole of Parliament would have burnt down and all the people in it. It would have been absolute carnage. This is not slaughter for slaughter's sake. The gunpowder plotters didn't just aim to destroy Westminster, they aimed to transform the English political landscape. Being a Catholic was dangerous enough, but being a Catholic plotting high treason was the most dangerous thing imaginable. Despite the huge risks involved, Guy and his fellow conspirators agreed to the murder plot. Even more importantly, they swore an oath to see it through. The oath in the Duck and Drake is a, it's a watershed moment. It's an oath of secrecy, but it's also an oath of action. If any of them decided to back out, they were not only letting God down, they were letting each other down and the cause down as well. So the oath is very, very important. What they're imagining is so atrocious, so devastating, that the only way, I think, to sanction that level of bloodshed is to say that it is justifiable by God. King James knew his regime was hated by Catholics across the land. What he didn't know was that his life, his government, and the future of England itself now lay in Guy Fawkes' hands. Guy Fawkes and five other Catholics planned to blow up the Houses of Parliament and with it the Protestant King James. It was the first stage of a breathtaking plan to spark a Catholic uprising and restore Catholicism as the state religion in England. Guy didn't just want to kill people. What he wanted to do was to actually change the very fabric of society and create a new world order. They know that the odds are stacked against them. Even if they destroy the king in Parliament, there's no guarantee whatsoever that the crucial next phase in their plan, the military rising to restore a Catholic England, is going to succeed. They know that the king is put there by God. They know that there is a strong chance that they will all go to hell for this. But they feel in their heart of hearts they have absolutely no other choice. The plotters were bound by a solemn oath to kill King James, but agreeing to do it was one thing. Actually doing it was quite another. The first challenge was to get hold of gunpowder. Gunpowder was easy enough to find in 1605. It had been an important weapon in the Spanish war against the Protestant Dutch. There was simply a lot of gunpowder about. You know, gunpowder was being produced for warfare. That warfare ends. Uh, it's like army surplus in 1945. The gunpowder plotters secure their gunpowder in small batches. They buy a barrel here, a barrel there, and they stockpile it. 36 barrels of gunpowder, and by barrels, I'm talking enormous barrels. The equivalent now of a nuclear warhead. <laughs> Getting the gunpowder to where it was needed would be far more difficult. 
the plotters began by renting a house right next to Parliament. Some historians believe that they began to tunnel from that house through the foundations of Parliament itself. They started work on this, and they persevered at the digging for some time. This was hard work. They were trying to hack their way through solid medieval foundations, 10, 12 feet thick. I don't believe for a moment there was ever a planned tunnel under the Houses of Parliament. Such a tunnel was never, ever discovered when the government looked for it. I have no idea of where the tunnelers would have got rid of all the massive masonry they had to take out. It just doesn't make sense. What we know for sure is that on the 25th of March, 1605, the plotters secured a lease on a cellar in the perfect place. A coal merchant gave up the lease of one of the ground floor vaults under the House of Lords. So here they had a very, very convenient location to pile up their gunpowder. The plotters get the gunpowder beneath the House of Lords by the simple act of renting a storeroom. This, I think, is probably the best description of just how much of a little rabbit warren Parliament was at this time. There's absolutely no security. It is a warren of private tenements mixed with government buildings, and there's no attempt to separate one from the other. In a series of dangerous journeys, Guy Fawkes began shipping gunpowder across the Thames and into the cellar. Guy has spent over a decade on the continent as a soldier. He brings a level of expertise that the rest of them lack, and it's sorely needed. He's had experience of siege warfare. He understands the power of gunpowder. They are dependent on him for advice when it comes down to the nitty-gritty of how you go about blowing anything up, let alone the Houses of Parliament. The gunpowder was hidden under bundles of firewood, and it would be Guy's job to guard it. Guy Fawkes has the huge advantage of being almost anonymous. The rest of these men are linked by family, they're linked by Catholicism. They're all within the government's radar. Guy's job was to act as the custodian of the powder because he is the unknown face, Guy Fawkes is the perfect guardian. He can go under an assumed name. He chooses to be known as John Johnson, and no one is any the wiser. King James had no idea of the scale of the plot developing against him, but his nose was certainly fine-tuned to danger. James is a king who is descended from a long line of monarchs who have died violently. His own mother had lost her head to an axe. His own father had been strangled after an attempt to blow him up. No wonder he's nervous. James's natural nervousness was fueled by the continual reports he was receiving of increasing Catholic unrest in England. I think the anger has reached boiling point. You've had decades now of Catholic persecution, of repression, of lack of freedoms, of humiliations. There are reports coming back from across the country that Catholic numbers are growing. Catholics are coming out from the woodwork. They're suddenly Catholics where you didn't think Catholics even existed. But James had employed a man he hoped would keep him safe. A man whose dearest ambition was to get rid of Catholics once and for all. Robert Cecil has risen to power in the last years of Elizabeth I's reign. He's a leftover. This 
small, hunched man, sort of just looking around all the time, mistrusting everybody. He is an evangelist for state security. That is his primary concern. If you go back through the state papers at this point, they are a rich, paranoid stew of spies' reports, of possible suspects, of people that you need to keep an eye on. There's spies positioned at all the ports to see who's going backwards and forwards. It extends the whole way across the continent. Robert Cecil put the full force of the state behind his spy operation. But it was no match for Guy Fawkes. Cecil's spies still had no idea that Guy was poised to carry out a deadly assault on King James and his government. But there was one thing the plotters couldn't control. When Parliament would next open. There is a danger in delay because there's more chance that it will be discovered before they can blow up Parliament. So now the, the challenge becomes to divert attention, to reduce any chance of suspicion falling on activities in Westminster. They disperse. Over the summer of 1605, they move out of London. Guy Fawkes left his gunpowder behind and travelled to Flanders, where he had spent much of the previous decade fighting for the Catholic cause. His main aim in going to Flanders is simply to vanish. He is the unknown face. He wants to stay the unknown face in London. In Flanders, Guy Fawkes waited anxiously for news from London. He thought he was safely out of sight, but little did he know that one of Cecil's spies was watching him. William Turner, the agent in the Netherlands, reports back to the English government that there are a couple of Catholics who seem to be behaving particularly oddly, one of whom is Guido Fawkes. But they have no idea of how important he is, and above all, they haven't the faintest idea of exactly what he is doing. It's one thing to know a name. It's quite another to put the face to the name. On the 28th of July, 1605, the King set a new date for the opening of Parliament, three months hence, on November the 5th. After a summer of keeping a low profile, Guy Fawkes felt confident enough to return to London. To Guy's relief, the gunpowder was still safely in place beneath Parliament. He resumed his disguise as John Johnson. It must have felt like an endless series of false starts. You've got your adrenaline up, you've got your expectations up, and then it's all off again. You'd expect him to be a gibbering wreck, and yet he seems to be so stoic, so calm. Meanwhile, Guy's partner in crime, Robert Catesby, took the further delay as an opportunity to make the plot even more ambitious. There's a natural double bind for the plotters, and that is the fewer the people who know about the plot, the more the chance it has of succeeding. But the fewer people who know about it, the fewer Catholics are going to be available to help with horses, cash, and spare swords. Catesby starts widening the circle. He starts bringing more people into the plot. And Catesby can't reassure everybody. He can keep the core group of plotters content, but he can't keep everybody content. He can't keep the lid on everybody's concerns. And I think as it grows, so the concerns grow. Rumours are starting to travel around the Catholic community by the summer of 1605. But they are simply that, they're rumours. Guy would have had moments of anxiety, he would have had moments of impatience, he's working mentally and emotionally at an optimum level, he's ready for the plot, he's ready to carry it out. November the 5th drew ever closer, and as each day passed, the danger of being discovered mounted. But little did Guy know that the greatest danger lay not with the government, but within his closest circle. 
with a fellow Catholic. Guy Fawkes and a team of conspirators were planning to blow up Parliament on November the 5th, 1605. The blast would not only kill King James and his entire government, but also a large number of Catholic nobles. Guy Fawkes would regard this as a necessary evil. You know, the, the means would justify the end, and if you have to wipe out a few Catholics to secure uh, Catholic ascendancy in England, the price is worthwhile. There are clues, uh, suggestions, straws in the wind that people in the Catholic community did know that something was afoot, even though they didn't know exactly what it was. Meanwhile, King James had spies everywhere, but he still had no idea that one of history's biggest terror plots was unfolding right beneath his feet. However, it wasn't James's spies who were about to blow the plot wide open. On the 26th of October, 1605, a member of parliament named Lord Monteagle was dining at home. Dinner was interrupted by the arrival of a mysterious letter from an unknown sender. My Lord, I would advise you to not attend this sitting of Parliament. Go to your estate in the country where you will be safe, because although there is no appearance of any problem, yet this Parliament shall receive a terrible blow but they will not see who it is that hurts them. The plotters had been betrayed, but by who? There is a dilemma if you're a Catholic at this time trying to stop the plot. How do you do so without incriminating anybody? How do you let the government know what's happening without handing over names? Because if you hand over names, your friends, your fellow Catholics will be arrested, they will be tortured, they will be executed. The most plausible candidate is the 13th man brought into the plot, Francis Tresham, a Northamptonshire landowner. From the moment he heard about the plot, Tresham didn't like it. He was appalled at the prospect, appalled at the bloodshed that would be involved, appalled at the risk to other English Catholics. Tresham, we know, was as Guy Fawkes and other plotters said, exceeding earnest to have Monteagle, who was his brother-in-law, spared from the destruction. This advice should not be ignored, as it may do you some good, and it can do you no harm, because the danger will have passed as soon as you have burned this letter. But some historians have other ideas. The balance of probability is the Monteagle letters written by Monteagle himself. Monteagle had good reason to want the plot discovered. He was a reformed Catholic rebel who was now a loyal servant to King James. It provides a perfect, and in the event, a really successful cover story for how he comes to know of the plot. Tresham is Monteagle's brother-in-law. I think the pair of them cook it up together. And it is a way of warning the government very cryptically that there's going to be an explosion. We'll never know who wrote the letter. But one thing is certain. This was a moment of crisis for Guy Fawkes and his fellow plotters. <laughs> The gunpowder plotters learn about the Monteagle letter and the fact that it's been passed to the Privy Council. So, of course, they want to know whether the government's taking this seriously. Cecil now had the first piece of evidence that could lead him to the gunpowder plot. But it was only that, the first piece. The letter is not rock-solid evidence. 
It's vague, it's general. It simply says that a blow will be struck. It could be anything, really, or it could be nothing at all. This could be complete imagination. Rather than informing the king immediately, Cecil decided to wait and to watch. If there is a plan to blow up Parliament, you can sort of let that tick over because Parliament's not going anywhere. You know when the opening is. It's the 5th of November. You've got till then. You need to find out what's going on elsewhere. Is there going to be a rebellion? Is there going to be an uprising anywhere? It might seem like a dangerous game, but there's a certain logic to it. And Cecil is an extremely logical man. Meanwhile, the plotters were so terrified that their secret was out that Guy stayed away from the cellar for several days. It wasn't until the 30th of October that he went to check on the gunpowder. And that is where you see Fawkes' bravery, because it is Fawkes, more often than not, who puts his head in the noose. He goes to the cellar. He is the man who checks to see whether anything's been disturbed. The gunpowder was still hidden beneath the firewood, apparently undiscovered. For Guy, this was a sure sign that the Monteagle letter had been ignored. He thought he was safe to continue the plot, but he was wrong. On November the 1st, Cecil finally showed the Monteagle letter to King James. The King's response was to order a search of Parliament. James is a very hands-on King. One of James's huge frustrations on coming to England is that he's kept so removed from the nitty-gritty of power. He would have seen nothing odd in taking a full role in uncovering the plot. Fawkes is absolutely ready to go on the 4th of November. He's there in the vault, watch and match and fuse. For Guy to get to the stage where he is now convinced and ready and prepared to carry out the plot would have been similar to a prize fighter who's gone through a process of mental, emotional, physical training. He just wasn't scared. He has a sense of duty. He's made an oath. Uh, and he's just gonna stay there and blow Parliament if at all possible. The search found nothing out of the ordinary, except for one thing. In a cellar directly beneath Parliament, they met a man who called himself John Johnson. The inspectors commented in surprise on the amount of firewood John Johnson had in his cellar, before passing on their way. I think the fact that they've gone away is the biggest reassurance that Guy Fawkes has had in the last week. They've seen him, they've had a word, they've pushed off. He's got less than 24 hours to get through. I suspect he feels that the crisis has passed. But just above Guy's head, the King himself was asking questions. Who was the mysterious man named John Johnson and what was he doing? They start thinking, well, are we absolutely sure that nothing's going on here? Is it worth going back and having another look? King James ordered a second search to be carried out, and the inspectors returned to the cellar. As they pulled away the firewood, they finally realized the full horror of what they had missed before. 36 barrels of gunpowder. The plot had finally been busted, only hours from success. It must have been so frustrating 
to be so close and to be captured. And yet you get no glimpse from him other than this stoical face. This absolutely defiant man. What he's feeling inside, one can only guess at. But the facade is absolutely stoical. The most desperate moment of Guy's life was perhaps the most triumphant moment of James's reign. It's just brilliantly handled by the government. What it does is catch Guy Fawkes at the last possible minute because they can reveal to the public that the plot has been really narrowly averted. The real aim for them is make people feel what a wonderful government they've almost lost. That very day, people burned bonfires in the streets of London to celebrate the saving of the king. I think the feeling must have been huge relief. Very quickly, people would have had this sense of what could have happened, of narrow escapes, of calamity averted. But behind the scenes, King James and his government felt far less safe than they let on. They had Guy Fawkes, but they had no idea who else was involved, or the full scale of the plot. This is a crisis. No one quite knows what's going on. There's a real potential threat to the state out there. And the sooner Guy Fawkes gives up some of his secrets, the better. There was one thing James wanted more than anything else, to come face to face with the man who wished him dead. Here we had Guy Fawkes meeting his mortal enemy, the person that is the very embodiment of everything that he is fighting against, the very person that he wants to kill. It must have been the most extraordinarily charged meeting with James trying to find out who Guy Fawkes is, what he is attempting, and Guy Fawkes attempting to keep the plot secret. It's James trying to satisfy his own personal curiosities. It speaks of James the intellect, James the mind, James the man who is fascinated by how people tick. What the king expects is to have a shivering captive who's going to beg for mercy and be prepared to trade information and the faint hope of his life. What he gets is this tall, good-looking, striking man who stares him in the eye and says simply he regrets nothing. Tradition has it that when James asks Guy Fawkes why he would have done this dreadful deed, Fawkes replies, I wanted to blow you back to your Scottish mountains. Guy refused to betray the plotters or reveal his own identity. But King James had another far more brutal way of loosening Guy's tongue. Guy ends up in a, a subterranean cell, probably in pitch darkness, in the Tower of London. Unheated, damp, horrifying. And since this doesn't seem to make any difference to him, the king issues the famous order. If he will not otherwise confess, the gentler tortures are to be the first used unto him. And so by degrees proceeding to the worst. Exactly what that meant, Guy was about to find out. Guy Fawkes was about to face a brutal interrogation on the orders of King James himself. So far, he had given away nothing, not even his real name. 
I personally am convinced that Fawkes was subjected to what they called the manacles at the time, and almost certainly the rack as well. There's the gentler torture, which is you're hung up by your hands for hours until your muscles scream. And the worst is to be laid out in a wooden frame with your arms and your legs attached to cords on pulleys. And the levers and the wheels are then worked on the pulleys until your limbs dislocate. <laughs> It's virtually impossible to be racked without being crippled for life. Most people, after even one session, you feel, would have given up. Fawkes keeps holding out. Guy holds out for days because he believes that the longer that he holds up the government, the more his friends have a chance to get away. To King James's frustration, Guy kept silent throughout the 6th, and into the 7th of November. The King himself sent down a list of questions to try and get Guy to talk. The King's really involved in the process. After all, he's met the chap eyeball to eyeball. James must have been fascinated as to why this man, Guy Fawkes, should hate him so much. What motivates him? Who is he? What is driving him? Late on the 7th of November, Guy finally revealed his real name. That same day, King James began receiving messages about a Catholic rebellion in the Midlands, which was about to reach a deadly climax. They head into the Midlands, they gather as much support as they can to carry out the second part of the plan. They get very little support because the English Catholics had the reaction they should always have expected from them, which is horror and disgust. After several days trying to gather support, Guy's co-plotters were finally cornered in a standoff. In the end, uh, the conspirators have a shootout. They're not taken by government troops. They're pinned down and rounded up or killed by the local militia. Four of the conspirators were shot dead, including the originator of the gunpowder plot, Robert Catesby. The rest were arrested. On the 9th of November, news reached London that the plot was over. That same day, Guy Fawkes signed a full confession. Once Guy had broken and had given the information away, he would have felt that he's failed God. He would have felt that he had betrayed everything that he believed in. Guy Fawkes had worked out in his own mind that God had not approved of the plan, and to someone like Guy Fawkes, a very devout man, that would have mattered to him extremely. While Guy lay broken in his cell, Parliament finally opened, and King James delivered a triumphant speech in which he took full credit for discovering the plot. As the wretch himself that is in the tower does confess, it was purposely devised by them. The horrible and fearful cruelty of their device was not only for the destruction of my person, but of the whole body of the state in general. He's able to tell them that all of them, every single person in that chamber, has narrowly escaped death. And the person who has prevented that is him, James, he has solved the plot. It is the most wonderful moment for him. King James had turned the greatest terror plot in history into a political triumph, and he would reap the benefits for the rest of his reign. His first parliament had been an absolute disaster. They'd been fractious. They hadn't given him any money to run the government whatsoever. His second parliament, having stood there in front of them and explained the plot and his part in it, gives him well nigh half a million pounds.
Guy Fawkes and his co-plotters were tried for treason and sentenced to a traitor's death, to be hung, drawn, and quartered. It's a big occasion for the crowds. State executions are, they are, entertainments and moral lessons. One can imagine they're stunned to silence by the enormity of what's happening in front of their eyes. But I think very few, apart from the handful of Catholics, would have felt any sympathy. Guy was the last to mount the scaffold, having watched his three comrades die before him. They were hung by the neck, then taken down, disemboweled, and cut up into pieces. Some suffered more than others. Those who are absolutely penitent are hanged until they're dead, or so almost dead they can't feel what's going on. Those who extenuate what they've done are hanged for five minutes or less, and then cut up while they're still alive and feeling everything. It's an exemplary punishment. It's a horrible punishment. Guy's journey from ground level up the scaffold was a slow and torturous one. He stumbled, he was in pain, nobody was helping him. The crowd was very, very silent as well. Guy was a soldier. He knew the risks of what he did. It's what he would have expected as the price of failure. He is then hanged. He is so damaged by the torture he has suffered that the small drop from the ladder is sufficient to break his neck. Disemboweled and quartered. So he dies before he has to face the quartering, the, the disemboweling. King James had triumphed over his mortal enemy, and he made sure the people knew it. Guy's head and those of the other plotters were displayed on spikes across London Bridge as a warning to any future traitors. The king really had it in for him. And this is why, I think, Guy Fawkes is the name we all remember. The same night, James lights a bonfire and puts an effigy of Guy Fawkes and the Pope on top of the bonfire, and we're doing that ever since. If the plot had succeeded, it would have been probably the greatest act of terrorism that we've ever seen. Mind-blowing that, that, that not only that people wanted to do it, but that they uh, very, very nearly got away with it. On the 15th of March, 44 BC, Julius Caesar, the most powerful man in the world, was brutally murdered. Among his assassins were close friends and allies. Who killed him? And why did Caesar have to die? We have extreme tactics in our drama premiere next on 5 USA from a man desperate to reclaim his daughter by adopting terror. We'll stay here to see what tactics Alex Polizzi uses to secure the right hunters. The hotel inspector, new in just a moment.